morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Um, sorry, it seems cold in here. Is it cold in here? No, it's okay. Okay, 50% of you are going to say it's fine, and the other 50% of you are going to say it's too cold. And the other 50% of you are going to say it's too hot. It's 150 percent um, Let's see. We need to talk center of mass. This is something I neglected to lecture in on purpose. Uh, so about, well, I don't know, 20 minutes of lecture. And then we'll get into today's lab, which all of you are fully prepared for because I handed out the lab packet on time. Of course not. I uh, forgot to get those out during the last test. So I will get the, we'll, 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 I'll orient you on today's lab a little bit more than I normally would. Because I know you didn't have time to read that. So <clears throat> uh, let's see, where's the, ah, here we go. Okay. This center of mass is something that, um, unlike kind of like most other places in physics 4A, you you have a good intuition for, it, right? Uh, this class has been all about you thinking you had good intuition and then me destroying it, right? And uh, all of you sort of feeling like you never understand anything because I keep telling you that you're wrong. When it comes to center of mass, though, I think you pretty much have this one nailed. So very quickly, let's define what it is, and then we'll talk about how we calculate it and how we need to be careful about where we put our zeros. Um, what's the center of mass of this meter stick? What's well, right in the middle, right? And how can you tell? It's balancing, right? Um, so the center of mass, very literally, is the location where an object would balance, okay? But that's kind of how you find it, that's not what it is. Gravity is pulling on all parts of this meter speed, meter speed equally, but, well, equally in the sense that, you know, gravity accelerates all objects at the same rate. But since I have the same amount of mass on either side of the middle point, that means gravity is pulling on the left-hand side just as much as it pulls on the right-hand side. And so what we get is a balance of torques, okay? And I know I just said the T word, okay? And I know you don't like the T word because you just got introduced to it yesterday. And uh, when you get into the homework, it's just going to be exceptionally hard, right? But <clears throat> I've got gravity pulling down on one side, gravity pulling down on the other. The distances are all equal, and so the net torque is zero, and we're good to go, right? It's not going to rotate. The center of gravity... Okay, is the point around or in an object that it appears gravity is pulling at. Here's another way to think about this. If I throw this meter stick through the air, okay, do the ends of the meter stick make a parabola as they fly through the air? Show us. It's, yeah, okay, catch it. <laughs> it's tumbling through the air as it goes. Right? So do the ends of the meter stick make that nice smooth parabola? Mm -mm. It's going to look like this. Right? As we track the end of that meter stick spinning through the air, it's going to do these wild gyrations. What's the thing that took the parabolic path? It was the center of mass, right? It was the point at which gravity appears to be concentrated in the object or pulling on the object. Gravity pulls on all parts of the object, but if we average all of those pulls, we will find the center of mass, right? And so up to this point in this class, everything that we've talked about, it doesn't matter if it's an art mark or a textbook or a car or anything, has been idealized to be this point object, really just a center of mass moving places. And what we're doing is we're transitioning now that we're talking about circular motion. We have to start worrying about how big things are. What are the dimensions of the wheel? How long is it? All, and as we get into chapters 11 and 12, we're going to have to start dealing with the actual physical dimensions of objects and where forces are acting on them. And so this is the beginning of understanding how important um, the center of mass and other things can be. Let me get rid of this because we don't need this anymore. And let's talk about how you go about finding and calculating it. Now, just to, just to be clear, okay, the center of mass does not have to be located within a physical structure. If I pick up this chair and I hold this chair out at arm's length, okay, the center of mass of the entire, okay, physics muscles, 
we'll see, okay, right? If I hold this out at arm's length, right, the center of mass of me and the chair together, this one sort of big L-shaped object, it could be floating out here in space. I actually had to kind of lean back, right, to make sure I pulled the center mass closer to my supports so I didn't fall over. We'll talk about stability when we get chapter 12. But it doesn't necessarily have to be located in the inside of an object. It usually is. But for certain sort of crazy shaped objects, it can be outside the physical structure. All right, so how do we calculate the center of mass? Uh, forgive me for sitting down. Lecturing in here is no good. If I lean over too much, it hurts my back. Um, so we have a equation that helps us define where the center of mass is. Okay? And okay, don't. Uh, not going to panic, right? Alright, I just write. I wrote a bunch of sums, right? Okay. But the idea here is, is that the top is a sum of products where we multiply a mass times its position in space. And then we add on another mass times its position in space plus another mass times it. You keep doing that over and over again until you're satisfied you got enough. And then you divide by, and what's a really what's an easier way to say the sum of all mass parts? This, well, okay, it's an integral. I'm not choosing to write those integrals today. <laughs> That's the total mass sitting at the bottom. Just add up all the masses. Okay, so what do I mean by a mass times a distance? So we could. We could say that the center of mass is here in the center of this meter stick, right? And we got to talk about where zero is here in a second. But if I want to find the center of mass location of this meter stick, I would need to like break the meter stick up maybe into one centimeter little chunks. And then I take the mass of that one centimeter chunk, multiply times its distance. And then the one right next to it's got a further distance out, right? Maybe same mass, but different distance. Same mass, right? I have to add all the, and then I have to do it all the way this direction, right? And I would add all that up, and I would get the center of mass. Let me see. I would divide by the mass so that I would get a position out, right? It's mass times position divided by mass, and I get a position out. So the, the mechanics of this, right, is to take first mass at times its position plus the second mass times its position plus the third times, and I can keep writing this, so instead I'm just going to write plus dot, dot, dot which means keep going with the pattern. And then at the bottom, divide by all of those masses and a dot, dot, dot. Now, you'll notice I did this in x. How do we find the center of mass in three-dimensional space? Well, yeah, but instead of x, you'd write y and instead of write z. So you can do this. It's independent x, y, and z, right? And you can find where the center of mass if you know where all your mass is and its position from, again, a certain point that we define as zero. So um, today in lab, we're actually only going to be doing this in one dimension. Okay? We're not going to do three-dimensional masses. And I'll never ask you to do three-dimensional masses in 4A. We'll save that for later. Uh, but the principle remains the same. So that's kind of the math of it, but we've got to we've got to be careful about how we define where mass is, like in relation to what zero point. So I think the best example of doing this is to go to the park, right? Um, the, the elementary school across the street got mad when I asked, "Can we just kick all the kids off of the playground?" Right? Let the college kids play. They said no. And when I asked, can we build a new playground, you know, can we have a playground at the new science building where we have teeter totters and swings, they said, they said, no. You're not allowed to have any fun in college. Uh, but um, they're, um, they're not, I haven't seen one in a park at a playground in a very long time. You guys know what a teeter totter is? Yeah. The playgrounds are becoming safer. They still have them. They still have them? Yeah. Because the playgrounds near our house, they started removing all of the fun toys that maimed children. They also have a little like seahorse on a spring that just bounces it. It bounces it. Uh, that was, uh, I mean, come on. Now, I want, 
I'm going to make several jokes here. I just want to be very clear. I believe in protecting children. Children are the future. You should never harm children. But I grew up where the playground was like a crucible of Darwin survival of the fittest, right? Like, like you went out for lunch break in third grade, and you weren't sure if you were going to make it back. Like, we learned survival skills. It was... It was an era where the monkey bars were like 30 feet off the ground, right? That a fall off the slide. Our slides were two and a half stories tall, made of steel. And we wore corduroys. So the coefficient of friction was like zero. And you would get, you, you, you'd be like, I don't know, 60, 70,000 miles an hour by the time you got to the end of that slide, right? It was, a, it was amazing. Nowadays, you got these plastic slides with like bumps in them, and the only joy you see is your kid coming off the bottom with their hair standing out on end because the static electricity is ramped up. They put, we we used to fall on like grass or concrete, and now they put down like rubberized bouncy mats or something like that. This is from the society where we think it's important that every fan has to be labeled with "Don't put fingers through grill." Then you can't make that fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway, let's go. Let's do. Let's do. Let's do. Uh, let's do teeter totter. Okay. So, um, and I'm actually going to calculate the center of mass of a teeter totter three times, maybe four. So, let's uh, come on. Let's say we've got a teeter totter. Okay. So, so teeter totter consists of that that main beam, right? Okay. And then there's uh, what we call the fulcrum, the place where the teeter-totter is either attached or articulates around or the, the thing that's sitting, right, the whole, the whole system up. Um, we're going to put one kid on this teeter-totter. And let's say we're going to put one kid on one end. Let's say they have a mass of 20 kilograms, OK? And then the teeter-totter itself has a mass of 10 kilograms. And then there's going to be another kid that's twice as massive. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to have this we're going to have this 40 kilogram kid. Okay, but we are not sure where the 40 kilogram kid needs to sit in order to balance the system. So, so I think if I asked you, okay, just where where would you put the 40? Can you guess where you would put the 40? Closer to the middle. Closer to the middle. Any exact guesses as to how much close to the middle? Half is close, right? Okay. So if we say that the whole teeter totter has a length of two meters, right? We've got our twenty kilogram kid is one meter over on the left. Chances are, you guys would say it needs to be half a meter to the right of the fulcrum, right? Okay. And you're you're intuing. Your intuition is not leading you astray there. You're doing, you're doing just great, okay? Because you've experienced this, or it just kind of makes sense. Double the mass, half the distance. You just did torque in your head. Congratulations. So we want to calculate this, right? We want to, we want to nail this down and then be able to do perhaps a more difficult situation. What should we do? Next slide. So um, how do we formalize this, right? Again, we're solving for where do we put the 40 kilogram kid? And of course, this is not based on any kind of personal experience where I was always the small kid and I had big friends. Um, so where do we put zero? Are there three natural places where zero can go? Are there more than three natural places? Well, like, what's, a, what's, a, what's a feel good place to put zero in this diagram? In the middle? In the middle? Sounds good, right? Like at the fulcrum, right? Right in the middle. Uh, what, any other places? One end or the other, right? It doesn't feel really good to put like zero right here, does it? Okay. Now, it doesn't matter. I mean, like fundamentally, in order for you to calculate the correct center mass, it doesn't matter where you put zero. As long as you're consistent, once you make your choice and you reference everything consistently from that point, you'll be good. 
But like all things in this class, devil's in the details, right? And, and really, Mr. Baylor, there is a good place, right? <laughs> okay? Like there's places that will make your life easier in terms of calculations, and we can be clever about what we there. So at the risk of confusing you today, I'm going to pick three, <laughs> right? I'm going to do middle, and I'm going to do either end. And in the end, spoiler alert, you're going to see that the location that we put the kid is exactly the same. All right. But just to show you over and over again how this works. So for this first one, okay, I will put zero right here at the middle of my system. In other words, I really want the center of mass. What, what I'm saying is, is I want the center of mass of my system to be where? At zero. I want the center of mass of the system to be at zero, so it balances at zero, right? And so I set the center of mass. I know my center of mass is equal to zero. It's right there in the middle. All right. Well, the center of mass has to be this sum stuff, right? So it has to be the 20 kilogram kid times the position of the 20 kilogram kid. And, and be careful. I know it's 8 o'clock in the morning, but think about it. Good. Negative 1. Why is the kid at negative 1? to the left of zero, right? So direction matters, and usually to the right is positive. So the position of the 20 kilogram kid is at negative one, okay? Um, where is the mass of the teeter-totter itself located? If it's a, if it's a uniform teeter-totter, meaning it's the same throughout, all by itself, it would have its center mass right at its middle. So where is the location of the center mass of the 10 kilogram thing? It's at the fulcrum, right? So we go 10 times 0. This is why sometimes you'll see in the problems, they'll say that the ladder or the teeter-totter or whatever is um, simple or negligible or massless. They'll, they'll give you some language that says, don't worry about the mass of the thing they're all sitting on, right? Only worry about the mass of the things that are on the ladder or that are on the teeter-totter or whatever. Very loud civil engineers. I'm loud, right? All right. So, all right. And then we have the 40 kilogram. Okay, so what do we put down for the position of the 40 kilogram kid? Good. This is our variable thing, right? This is the thing we're solving for. We know the answer is plus one half, right? We know it has to be over half of a meter, right? But let's let's let the let's let the math work it out for us. All right, what do I put on the bottom? Sum of the masses, and what's the sum of the masses? Looks like 70, doesn't it? Okay, I'll write it out. It's going to be 20 plus 10 plus 40, but that's equal to 70. Okay, well, notice, because I've put my zero at the center of mass location of my system, I've made the algebra really easy. Why is it easy when you've got a zero over here? You can multiply both sides by the denominator, and you still get zero over here, and this one cancels out, right? Okay. So I'm just left with, like mathematically speaking, I'm just left with a uh, zero equals a negative 20 plus a 10 plus a 40x. And even Mr. Baylor can do that one, maybe. That's going to be 10. No. I move the 20 over. That's why I was like, there's an extra factor of 10 in here that shouldn't exist. And that's what happened. All right, so we get, um, let's put the clean edge up to stay. Ah, Plus 40, all right, there we go. And so we end up with 20 equals 40x, which means x is equal to plus 1 half, right? Which is, again, what we expected. We expected that the 40 kilogram kid would be half as far, right? Okay. Now, when I played with my friends all bigger than me, they would sit on one end, I would sit on the other, and I would win. I'd be the one that's up high. That's winning, right? Okay? They'd always be down there. It's no fun for them. I'm flying up in space. Great. And yes, I was. They attempted to launch me several times. All right. I always, it was, it was with my agreement. It was consensual. Okay. So... Let's do, let's do, okay, uh, let's do, let's do this here. 
Okay, so again, just doing the same problem, only I'm going to put it on the left hand end of the, uh, put my zero at the left hand end of my teeter totter. So, so what changes here? Ah, the center of mass is now no longer at zero. Where is it? It's at one meter. We still want the center of mass to be at the middle of the teeter-totter. But now, because I changed my zero, that center of mass is now at plus one. And so what do I write down? It's 20 times zero, right? We've changed where everything is. Plus 10 times a one, plus 40 times an x, all over again, 70 now, right? So here, the math has become a little bit hard. This isn't terrible, right? But maybe if you had a lot of things going on, you could see how maybe it, could, it would be advantageous to have zero on one side. But I can handle it. Well, I didn't handle the first one. Maybe I can't handle this one. 70 equals uh, 10 plus 40x, right? And then 70 minus 10 is 60 equals 40x, which means x is going to be equal to, uh-oh. That's a different answer, isn't it? One half before and three halves now? What is this? It's the same physical location on the system, isn't it? Just referenced from a different zero point. So it's important when you're calculating center of mass that you're communicating, okay, this is where I'm referencing everything from, right? Here's the center of mass. Location can appear to be different even though it's in exactly the same physical location. All right, one more. Uh, let's put zero just on the left-hand side, okay? Now, be really, really careful. Where is the center of mass location now? It's at negative two. Yes, no. Oh no, it's a negative one. I was already on the twenty kilogram kit. I was I was I was I was two steps ahead already. Okay, right? Yes. The middle of the thing is at negative one. And then the twenty kilogram kid, now that I spilled the beans, is where? Negative two. Yeah, that's what I was I'm always very heavy. Where's the 10 kilogram mass? That's at negative one. And then, oh dear, what do, what do we write down for the 40? It's, we don't know where it is. So what do we write? 40 times x. Don't, don't put a negative on that one. Don't, don't. Let the equation give you the negative. Do we expect the answer to be negative one half? Right? It's same physical location. Let's see if the equation knows enough to get this right. If we put a negative sign on this x right here, that's like telling, it's like giving away too much. This x is an unknown. Let it stay unknown. It can be positive or negative, assuming we set everything up right correctly. Okay, so I'm still dividing by 70. So now I have negative 70 equals, oh my gosh, negative 50. Did I do that right? Okay, plus 40x. And a negative 70 plus 50 is a negative 20. Well, it's starting to feel good. And so this is negative one half. So again, all of these things are in exactly the same physical place in the system. They just differ in the value because of where we chose to put them. So calculating center of mass isn't hard as long as you are sure you know, you're kind of clever about where you pick zero and you obey, right? Where you pick zero by minding your minus sign. Generally, everything to the left is negative. Everything I'd say it'd be different as long as it's clearly stated. You can use that every one. All right. So that center of mass, right? And we need to talk about today's lab. So I'm going to stop the recording.
So just like any like lecture we would have done in the other room, I recorded that portion, right? And I'll have the PDF up and all that sort of stuff.